into the night Wanting some place to hide This weary soul Yeah This bag of bones Yeah, yeah. I tried with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting The bag
Welcome back to another Thursday at Bible Study. It's so good to have you here. My name is Minister Kelly. I know it's a little different than we've normally had in the past. We usually have a panel, but if it's okay, would you be my panel today? So whatever you're doing, if you could just join me for this one hour or less uh, and get into the comment section and talk to me converse with me, interact with each other, I would love that. Matter of fact, while you're doing that, you can like, you can share, you can subscribe to our channel. We would love for you to join us regularly. And so we're going to get into another verse, and we're jumping into chapter 6 today. We're studying the book of Romans. It's titled, From Letter to Life. And so we're coming out of just knowing the Word of God, and we're trying to allow the Word of God to give us new life. And so in the introduction to Romans, I just want to go over three main points. The purpose. Apostle Paul wrote this book. The purpose of him writing this book is the fact that he never visited Rome, but he heard about how great their faith was. And so Paul wrote this book so that they would know the gospel of Jesus Christ and so that he could aid in uniting new believers together. Audience, our audience here is for all of Rome. And so Paul was writing to all the Christians in Rome. His hope was that everyone would read his letter as it was really beneficial at the time. And there's some key themes we say every week, but it's super important for us to know that these are the things that the book of Romans covers. One being the universality of sin and freedom from sin. We have justification by faith in the role of the law, the righteousness of God, unity in the body of Christ, living in the spirit, and lastly, practical Christian living. So really quickly, a recap of chapter 5. Chapter 5 talks about how Christ's sacrifice overturned the effects of Adam's transgression brought on by the consequences of Adam's sin. Also, Paul illustrates how Christ's sacrifice brought justification and life to all believers. So, chapter 6. We're going to get into our chapter for the week. Are you ready? Be honest, you washing dishes? Judging you, judging you. I'm joking. So <laughs> remember, I'm going to ask some questions. I would love for you to comment. I would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. So we're going to read the first section, Romans 6, 1 through 14. This section is called Dead to Sin, Alive in Christ. Romans 6, 1 through 4, it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The apostle now is redirecting his attention to those who use grace, God's grace, as an excuse to go on sinning. If you've been here for other chapters, you know that we've spoke a lot about faith and we've spoke a lot about the liberties that we've been given through grace. But Paul is coming to bring balance to the conversation. And so Paul shines a light 
by warning the Romans about the consequences of misusing God's grace in the face of sin. We have the blessing and the benefit of grace as believers, but it is not an excuse to abuse it or to partake in sin. An important key term and concept mentioned in this section is baptism. You might be familiar. Baptism means to immerse or to submerge. It means to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to overwhelm, to be fully wet. Baptism is a Christian rite. It was instituted by Jesus himself. Baptism is also a part of the Great Commission. You can find that in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Baptism, however, is not a requirement for salvation, nor does it mean you will never sin again once you're baptized. We still undergo the process of sanctification, which we're going to get into a little bit later. But baptism is an illustration of a believer's identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When a believer gets baptized, they are declaring that they have died in their sin in their union with Christ's death. Baptism is also an act of faith. By faith, we surrender complete control of our lives. And a story that goes really nicely with this point is the conversion story of Simon the Sorcerer. If you want to know more about it, you can read about that in Acts 8, verses 9 through 13. But Paul illustrates this visual of death and resurrection using the imagery of baptism, stating that just as Christ was raised from the dead, believers too are raised into the newness of life. I'm interested. What are some common misconceptions you've heard about baptism? And how can knowing the truth about baptism aid a believer in their walk? Comment. I would love to hear your thoughts. And you have the benefit of pausing, too. While you do that, I'm just going to read on a little bit further. Verses 5 through 11. It says, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, meaning the body of sin may be free and loose from the power of sin so that we can no longer be enslaved to sin. For one, which is Christ, who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul explains that since believers have been united with Christ in his death, they also will be united with him in his resurrection. Resurrection is part of the Christian faith. We believe that Christ was resurrected by the Holy Spirit after his death on the cross. So that means we too will be resurrected after death with him. What does resurrection mean? Resurrection means to arise again. So this is an important part, though, because resurrection, the whole of the New Testament rests on the revelation of resurrection. It's a historical fact, and it is one that is a fundamental doctrine of the gospel. Without it, we don't have the gospel. <laughs> when Christ rose, he broke the power of death. We know this because Paul tells us, but also John tells us, I am he, he was quoting Jesus, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And the keys and have the keys of hell and death. And then 1 Corinthians 15 and 14, we read, and if Christ was, has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Paul is telling the Romans that they must consider themselves dead. 
referring to the old man, meaning we are no longer at the hand of sin or bound by a slave owner. This, however, does not mean that we don't have a desire to sin. It just means that sin doesn't rule over us anymore. We have an alternative. We have a choice. So some more supporting scriptures. Galatians 5 and 13. It says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. That's a different alternative, right? 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's move on. Let's move into Romans 6, verses 12 to 14. Paul writes, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey his passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. An aggressive hallelujah goes right there. <laughs> These verses highlight the believer's responsibility to live in obedience to God, empowered by his grace, and to resist the control of sin in our lives. This responsibility comes as a result of being resurrected with him. It's a result of walking into this newness of life. So, Let's get into responding versus working. So this is important. Believers should not confuse what God has empowered us to do by grace with working to be saved. These two are not the same. We are responsible for utilizing what the Lord has given us to resist sin. That is our responsibility. This includes reliance on the Holy Spirit through prayer and fasting, the fruit of the Spirit, leaning into God. It is our job to steward our freedom well. With that said, we do not do this because we want to be saved or to keep our salvation or to earn our salvation. Our stewardship of our freedom from sin is our response to being saved. The power of sin was broken at the cross. Now our job is to respond to his grace is to respond to this freedom, is to respond to his love. And this is how we do it. So let's go back to verse 12. Verse 12 says, Let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. That's what the preachers say, right? I'm glad you asked. And so let's get into three ways we could do that. Recognize, resist, and rely. We can recognize, resist, and rely. We can recognize what tempts us. That's pretty important, right? Know what tempts you. Galatians 6, 1 through 2 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you are spiritually, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. But bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah? Second one, resist. Resist by practicing self-restraint. This is something that we all can do. Why? Because self-restraint is self-control, and that's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, then you have self-control, and you have patience, and you have joy, and you have love, and you have all the things that the Holy Spirit comes with. And so resist by practice, practicing 
Self-restraint. James 1, 19 to 20 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce righteousness of God. Last one, rely. Rely on the source. I know it's simple, but practicing it is a different thing. Rely on the source. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul is saying, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We were resurrected for a reason. We are to live lives that reflect the salvation we have received. So it is our responsibility to not let sin rule us. Another supporting scripture you can find in 1 John 3 and 9. It says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So I know I gave you some, but what are some practical ways that we as believers can keep from serving sin? And I know sometimes when we hear sin, our mind goes to big sins, and we think of iniquity, which is the heavier, more obvious sins like stealing and murder and lying. But even those things can be not as obvious. You are able to murder with your mouth. You are able to steal in other ways, right? There are sins of omission. There are sins of commission. There are things that uh, the Lord has instructed us to do that we didn't do or we didn't do what we know God expected us to do, sins of omission, right? There's sins of commission, just things that we were just deliberately disobedient in. So in order to walk this out, what are some practical ways that we can keep ourselves daily from serving sin? Write that in the comments. And we're moving on to another section that's called Slaves to Righteousness. That's going to be found in Romans from verses 15 to 23. Slaves to righteousness. Paul says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves of impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So I just want to take a moment to echo Joshua 24, verses 14 to 15. Joshua says, now, <laughs> therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I just wanted to say that. That blessed me. But under the law, Paul is talking about under the law, sin was our slave master. Now God's grace has given us the freedom to obey Abusing grace is like cheating on a test. You might pass the test, but you will fail in development when you don't learn the lesson. So if you perfect cheating, then you'll grow spiritually deformed, 
where your goal now becomes to perform instead of to become. And that's not what we want. Sanctification involves more than a mere moral reformation of character brought on by the power of truth. It is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the whole nature more and more under the influences of the new gracious principles implanted in the soul in regeneration. What that means. <laughs> in other words, sanctification is carrying on to perfection. The work that begun in regeneration and it extends to the whole man. All of me is impacted in the process of sanctification, right? And regeneration just means new birth. So through God's sanctifying work, Christians begin to imitate Jesus and reveal characteristics that are consistent with his. Sanctification is not, let's go there, right? Sanctification is not perfection. It's not being perfect. It's not never making a mistake. But it's committing to the process of being perfected. And even when I say perfected, I'm not talking about never making a, mis uh, a mistake. I'm talking about spiritual maturity. It's commitment to the process of being spiritually mature. What sanctification is not, it is not a means to earn God's love. He proved his love at Calvary. Sanctification is us responding to his love. Sanctification is an ongoing process of dying and rising, dying and rising, dying and rising, and we do that daily. It's one of self-discipline, and it's, re it's the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. You do not want to do sanctification without Holy Spirit. You can simply ask for the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will give it to you. Sorry, give him to you. Let's read Philippians 2, verses 12 to 13. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God that gives us the want and the power to actually please him. It all comes from him. And when it says work out your own salvation, it doesn't mean works in the sense that Paul used it previously. It doesn't mean to do things uh, for your own salvation. It means to cultivate it. It means to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit is changing you. How do you do that? The Bible tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. So one way we can cooperate and agree with the Holy Spirit is that when you hear, listen, obey, follow. It means to actively pursue spiritual maturity and not settle for partial obedience. In these verses, Paul reminds the readers of their past slavery to sin and their new slavery to righteousness. He is encouraging them to live in submission to the new master, Christ Jesus, and avoid getting caught up in the sins of their old lives. We must starve our flesh and feed our spirit. Why? Because whatever we feed grows. Listen to this new identity. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 through 11, he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. This is our new identity. A holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Testimony time. 
What role has the Holy Spirit played in your sanctification process? Please tell me. I can't wait to read it. What role has the Holy Spirit played in your sanctification process? How has he showed up in your life? In what ways has he changed you and blown your mind and you knew that this is the work of the Holy Spirit? I'm really excited about that one. I'm going to read Romans 6, verses 20 to 23. Paul writes, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness, which means you had no desire to conform to God's will, right? When we were under the slavery of sin, we had no desire to conform to God's will. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things which you are now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For when we were slaves to sin, we felt no obligation to do right. But now we are alive, and we are ashamed of those things that led us on a path of eternal doom. Our path to holiness has been made. You are free to choose between two masters, but you are not free to adjust the consequences of your choice. Each of, two, of the two masters pay with its own kind of currency. The currency of sin is eternal death. That is all you can expect. That is all you can hope for in a life without God. Christ's currency is eternal life. New life with God that begins on earth and continues forever with God. What choice will you make? Eternal life is a gift from God. And if it's a gift, then it's not something that we can earn. It's not something that we can even pay back. A gift cannot be purchased by the recipient. <laughs> a more appropriate response, though, to a loved one who offers you a gift is a graceful acceptance with gratitude. There is no neutral position either. We will become a slave to something, sin or God. A Christian still can sin, but a Christian is no longer a slave to sin because he or she belongs to God. We've been purchased back by the blood of Christ. So in conclusion, Romans 6 is about the profound implications of a believer's union with Christ. This is possible because of the radical break from the power of sin and a new identity in Christ. Paul stresses that this new identity is not a license to sin, but a call to live in the obedience of God. Paul shows us the difference between the reign of sin and the reign of grace. He's urging believers to offer themselves as slaves to righteousness, which leads to holiness and ultimately eternal life. The Father is trusting us to steward this great liberty that he's given us well. And with his help, we will. I'm so excited that you came to join us today. Listen, I'm just going to take a moment and pray really quickly. But I want you to tell me your takeaways in the comment. Let me know what chapter 6 did for you, what you are walking away with. I'm so grateful for you. We're going to give you an opportunity to give and to practice generosity. And so the giving information is going to come up at this moment. But really quickly, I just want to come into agreement with you and just pray really quickly. Um, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you so much for what we've heard and what we've seen today. We thank you, O oh Lord, for solidifying your truth in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you, O oh God, for breaking us free from sin. We thank you for giving us another alternative, and not just any alternative, but we thank you for giving us the gift of you. 
we thank you that we get to be your, yours fully and wholly. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, and I can't wait to see you again.